Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is the Fire and Ice show, and Franco and I are our friends, so don't worry here. So I'm going to tell you how uh, in the two years since I left SNOV without any neuroorthopedic techniques, you've already seen how I called Emily and we've changed our practice. We, uh, with uh, my team in Victoria, we decided to become a neuroorthopedic center. So first I have to say that nothing we do could not have been done with the incredible contribution of the French literature. We discovered it two years ago and we've been reading everything you've written, so thank you so much. Et vous pouvez poser des questions en français, bien sûr. So this is where we live on Vancouver Island. We do conferences. We want you all to come. It's the, one of the world's most beautiful islands. It's the um, area, medical area of Switzerland or Belgium on this island. So this is me. It's not having sound, but it's saying, don't, don't, don't. This was me in my practice. So for many years, I was an expert in early intervention. We see all of our patients right away. We actually treat everyone early. We don't my patients did not have a lot of really bad neuroorthopedics because we followed them from like day one. However, this guy shows up at a meeting in Amsterdam. This is Terry Daltom. And in Belgium, there's a problem because every picture of Tintin, they walk with a hyperextended foot. So in Belgium, in order to be a good physiatrist, you have to get really good heel strike. So uh, unfortunately, Terry has been struck by this. He has to make his perfect patients walk right. But he really made me feel stupid like Homer Simpson, that there was a whole world of neuroorthopedics. After 10 years of going to spasticity conferences, nobody ever spoke about before Terry. So then I came here two years ago and my life changed in the fireworks and I got really, really angry and Marianne Keenan helped me. But I had a lot of help. So the French have all these books on motor nerve blocks and we decided to help. I called Dan from Paris, said when you get home you have to teach us nerve blocks, but we are ultrasound people, we can use ultrasound. And I called Allergan to pay for my friends to come from Vancouver. So we got together, Rajiv came and we had six doctors, two anesthesiologists, four hours, a plane to get there, and we decided to learn nerve blocks. So uh, thankfully, Francois Genet had just published this beautiful paper, which became our Bible. So this was our very first attempt at a nerve block. It took us three seconds to see the musculocutaneous nerve and the branches. That's on an anesthesiologist on the right. On the left, on the right, this is a spastic patient. The anatomy is the same. It's denervated, but you see the blood vessels and the branch. So we tried our very first nerve block, and this woman, my colleague, she had never touched an ultrasound or a needle before, but she performed a perfect nerve block to the brachialis branch of the musculocutaneous nerve in about a minute. So she learned in a minute how to do it. So we were really happy that we could get a good result, and you can actually see the uh, lidocaine um, right here. So here's Rajiv doing the first nerve block. Um, as you can expect, his V3 is gone, but his V1 stays around the same. So we assume he has some degree of contracture in the muscle. So we did four patients that day, two arms, two legs. And Dan, being an anesthesiologist, said, well, why don't you just freeze the nerve? It'll be much better. And I said, what? So Dan has been doing percutaneous cryonerotomy in his office. It's a pain procedure on sensory nerves. It's been done for thousands and thousands of patients. And you don't get like phenol neuritis or neuroma. So the way it works is that you just exactly the way you do a nerve block. You put a needle in through the skin, nothing special, no special OR. You touch the nerve. That's why we have to do ultrasound. And what happens is that minus 60 degrees, you get myelin disruption, valerian degeneration, but the basal lamina stays, the epineurium and the perineum. You don't get pain, you don't get neuritis because you're not actually cutting, you're not releasing neurotropin. So what actually happens is here, the uh, axon will break down and go away completely, and then it becomes a length-dependent lesion, like getting a radiculopathy in your back. It will then, after it goes away, it can grow back, but it's a length dependent. So in pain, if you're doing a facial branch of the nerve, it might only be millimeter per day for that long. In a tibial nerve, hopefully you're actually getting up to two years or more. So we have this process that we decided to do. The problem was, is how do you do it on a motor nerve? So I went to the literature, we, we searched and searched and searched. We found one case from the 1990s in an, a multiple sclerosis patient on an obturator nerve, and that was it. We later found a proof of concept study, very well written from the United States, that was never published. It was just a case report of 15 patients in the elbow. There were lots of rat studies. So we asked our patients, do you want to try something? They all had nothing to lose, so they said sure. Trescott is the champion, she's an American, I believe she's PMR, or anesthesia, is she an anesthesia. She's done tens of thousands, and she says exactly what we do with nerve block, 
small diagnosis of anesthesia, meticulous localization, and you can do this. So here's Rajiv with our first patient. He has no V3. He has a, uh, a V1 of about 140 some degrees. We did our cryonerotomy, and this is him two weeks later. Now what's interesting is he's not used that arm in years, so he never tried to actually open it. So I said, well, why don't you open it? He has 70 degrees of active range of motion before the procedure, and he's like, oh, my arm's opening. So this is the neuroplasticity. He has to relearn how. So he's pretty excited, and if we look at the change, we go from 97 degrees to 112 in V3, but V1 is markedly improved, but his Ashworth is so little, you don't even see the V3. We have to look for it. So you wonder, how long is it going to last? So I continue to inject botulinum toxin, of course. I just take 100 units from brachialis and put it somewhere else. So he's actually getting a lot better with time. He's quite pleased. Uh, he's got a lot of power. He's now mowing the lawn. He can pick up and hold his grandchildren. He has a huge amount of things that he can now do with his arm. It was stuck like this all the time. Uh, it's really doing well at six months. We're getting good effect. I've now injected him almost twice, but um, at a year he has great range of motion and you can see the clonus decreasing. So this is what Franco says, we can't forget about the rehab. The rehab is super crucial. This man has a full extension. He went to Mexico on holiday. Nobody knew he had a bad arm. His wife was really happy. So we've decided uh, Jean-Michel Garcia's paper is my absolute favorite paper of all time because we don't learn the Tardu scale well. So we are tracking all of our patients like this. We have a uh, V3 pre and post block and then we follow them in their V3, V1. We look at the precis angle, active range of motion, and their Ashworth scale. So we're doing this for every patient with video analysis. So here's our second case from that first day when Rajiv was there. And you can see she gets a good result from her first cryonerotomy. She gains 40 degrees of active. And you know, passive, the patients don't care about, except for caring. I can now extend my arm. When I walk, people don't notice very much. But you know, here's her um, motor block. So this is before her motor block, and this is cryo. It's a lot better, but you can actually see there's a bit of a violent lift of her pec. So it's actually her brachioradialis, you can see. Now, I had absolutely no idea how to do a brachioradialis block, but Marianne Keenan, you wrote a paper. You're the only person, so thank you. So I, I took Marianne Keenan's paper, and I didn't quite know where the nerve was, but we just did a, a local block to the brachioradialis, and she's really good now, super loose. We thought she had some contracture. She doesn't. So Dan repeated the uh, crown neurotomy to the brachioradialis, and she again gained more range of motion, and she's super floppy. Her main thing is what? No pain. I go to bed every night, and I have absolutely no pain. I'm so happy in the morning. So this is another case of an old patient of me who refused to get any more toxin because it didn't work. Um, I'd known her since she's 18. She has... Um, a good response to a block. She actually didn't even want to come in until she met the other patients because she hates needles. So she had a good result. So, you know, we look at her active range of motion, but unfortunately she has a lot of clonus. So the clonus is really getting in the way of her active range of motion. So Dan did the cryonerotomy, and one month after we see a huge improvement. Again, no contracture. Um, it's so much easier to move the arm. She feels light. It's carrying. What we thought was a V1 is not a V1. But the problem with her is that if you watch her actively, there is still clonus. Alors, uh, Professor de Normandie, vous êtes là? OK. OK. Qu'est-ce que la cause de son clonus? Can someone tell me what the cause of the clonus is? Poignet? So people are saying the poignet? OK, well, let's find out. So, um, so Dan, you can really see her clonus here, beautiful. So at three months, her, it's much, much better because we're getting Wallerian degeneration. It's only gonna get better with time, but the clonus is still bothering her. So I actually did a median nerve block and you can see it's mostly the uh, finger flexors that are causing it more than the, the, um, the, so we do a motor nerve block, we reassess the patient. I did uh, Botox to the uh, fingers. And uh, you can see they're opening very nicely, and she's thrilled because the hands go open. Of course, she was a little bit angry because she carries thing in that, in that clawed hand, but she's compensated. So we're using it as an adjuvant. We're taking out the most dominant muscle and then doing toxin for the rest. 
So here's another case of a musculocutaneous nerve. So this woman has, this is Dan here, a very tight catch. Post, she had a beautiful musculocutaneous nerve block, good range of motion, and she can actually, with the, the motor nerve block, on the next slide here, after this, she can pass on her own actively, this is on her own, she extends well. So then we also did a, uh, a median nerve block because Emily can do surgery now uh, to release her FDS. So the combination of two nerves, you can see I can very easily open up her fingers with one hand before I had to forcefully pry them open. And she's going to be having surgery with Emily on her hand. So what I want to show you here, this is the day of the cryoneurotomy. So you can see the lesion within a minute, she already has improvement, but it's only going to get better with time because of Wallerian degeneration. So we see them again after. Um, she lives about three and a half hours from me, so I've asked one of my colleagues to inject her. So we decide where we're gonna put the toxin for the next injection. And what's great is most of our patients are on 600 units or 400 units already. They're on quite a high dose. And we have a lot more fun now because we can take the toxin from the muscles that we've released and use them somewhere else. So here would be an ultrasound gu uh, guide of the uh, tibial nerve block, and uh, Pacelli's paper is gold, so thank you. So this is me going in. I'm not happy that I'm I have to contact the nerve for cryoneurotomy. So I'm going to go out, reposition to the branch to the uh, medial gastrocnemius at really low stim. It works. You're going to see that I have to touch it. It can't be a diffusion. There's my lidocaine. But now we really felt clinically it was gastrocnemius, so I'm going to reposition. Here's the branch to the lateral head of gastrocnemius, which I can see. And you can see how fast our um, nerve blocks are. They're very quick. So I know lidocaine, immediate cessation, and we're done. So this woman was pregnant, and she went to her physiatrist in tears. She has two children. Um, she's pregnant, she can't wear her AFO, and she can't get Botox because she's pregnant, so she's very upset. So uh, Dan immediately got her in. This is the day of the cryoneurotomy, the change in her gait function. Um, she's ecstatic. And then, of course, I mean, you can criticize her gait pattern. You might want to give her a splat or something, but she's pregnant. She's now nine, she's eight months pregnant here, and she can walk better than she's walked in three years, so she's thrilled. We just called her back into clinic to come here, so she's not pregnant anymore. This is her walking with her, orth her ankle foot orthosis on Altez, and this is her without. She doesn't want any more procedures. She's really happy with this. So at 10 months, what we're finding is all of them are getting function, and I really we're hoping the longer we keep them from re probably plasticity, lengthening motor, and they will be good. So this is a case of a, a deformity that exceeded our expectation. So we are doing pec muscles, as Emily showed you the slide before. So this is the, la we're doing lateral pec of the, uh, of the um, pectoral nerves. Emily is doing medial for resections. So here's a patient of Emily's. He's a quadriplegic with severe spasticity issues. He's on 100 milligrams of baclofen and 600 units of botulinum toxin, but it, his arms really close. He's very incomplete, so he has little bits of movement anywhere, but he's on a sip and puff wheelchair. He cannot use it. He's having tons of pain in the shoulder, and the caregivers have to really fight him in any attempt to... Um, of, uh, to dress him or change him. And Dan did two very, I usually do the nerve block in my clinic first. I refer to Dan and he repeats it to make sure he's correct. Very good candidate. So Dan did the uh, pectoral nerve blocks and it's very good. This man does not have a lot of active movement. He's a C4 incomplete, but he has a little bit. His caregivers and he are thrilled. There's no pain, he can move it. And again, I've taken all of his toxin and moved it somewhere else. Now this patient is an interesting because Emily d had already done a uh, deltoid axillary nerve transfer to triceps and we had just discovered on EMG he was re -innervating. So Emily was super happy that she's giving him triceps function. But the problem was because of his tone, he couldn't lift his arms off his wheelchair to use the extension. After cryo, he can do this. So we cry a lot in clinic. We're very emotional people. But uh, he can now uh, externally rotate on his own. So I, I brought him back into clinic to do a brachio, brachialis because he's a bit tight. And Emily said, don't touch the brachialis. I'm going to give him hand function. So uh, the three of us working together sort of solved the case. So we're really happy. And he's incomplete, so he wants to re -innervate. Emily will not cut his nerves because he might continue to get function over the next five years as an incomplete. 
So here's a median nerve under ultrasound, incredibly easy to do. So this is one of our median nerve blocks, which is the basis of all the surgeries that Emily and I do. You have a non-functioning hand, you do a median nerve block. If the hand opens fully, you ask them to bend. If they can bend their two fingers, they've got some uh, FTP function of ulnar nerve. They can get an FDS neurectomy. So this is Dan uh, in his clinic. So one of our patients that Dan had done a very successful cryoneurotomy to the musculocutaneous nerve, he was so happy with his cryoneurotomy, and you can see just from the block, his carrying angle, he's walking faster, he's really happy. D uh, Dan had done a beautiful cryoneurotomy of the musculocutaneous, and he hates that his hand sits in a fist. It's very disfiguring. So Dan did a nerve block, and what we've been discovering is our stroke patients feel no sensory disturbance, a lot of them, from a nerve block, because they don't feel. My hand, c'est froid, it's dead, I don't feel it. So Dan, with his permission, did a cryoneurotomy of the entire median nerve. It's non-functioning. He has no sensory dysesthesia, and he can open it on his own. He's really, really happy. So um, I'm going to ask Dan to come up, because he's really the hero of this story. But these are the nerves uh, based on the uh, literature that we have picked out. We are picking nerves that are pure motor. We do do sensory if needed, but almost every one we do is a pure motor. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Dan. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, opportunity to present something new. This one. Okay. Um, I'm going to go real quick because we don't have much time, but I use the Lloyd SL2000 Neurostat. It's no longer available, but we've been able to keep it going for the better part of 20 years. It's been in British Columbia, in our province, for about 30 years. We do all of our nerve blocks at least twice, make sure exactly what we're seeing is what we want and that we don't have any sensory disturbance. Uh, when I do the procedure, I use a th number 16 thermo-insulating catheter. The probe is 1.2 millimeters, and it passes right through there. The thermo-insulating catheter is also electro-insulating, so I can stimulate very well. This is the machine. Um, two E-cylinders of CO2, which passes at high pressure, 700 tor, or PSI. Uh, through the tubing and through a, a little needle that you will see. It has a timer built in. It also has neurostimulation built in, and we can monitor the gas flow. This is the theory behind it. Um, the gas passes in the outside, and there's a constriction here, and as the gas passes through the constriction, it, absor it absorbs heat. So the patient doesn't get any gas in their body. It's all through the needle. We can stimulate through the needle as well. And um, the needle is about this long, so I can use other body parts. This is the ice ball that we form. Uh, this is about uh, three and a half minutes into the cryo. This ice ball is 0.8 millimeters long and 0.6 wide. This is the uh, number 16 gauge catheter. This is the handle, and that's the 1.2 millimeter uh, cryoprobe that's passing through there. I can stimulate with the ground pad here, which you will see. And very uh, there's the tip of the needle. And I think I'm doing musculocutaneous nerve in this case. So. Here's the important thing. I need a little local anesthetic here for the skin, but they don't feel any pain in the muscle with that 16 gauge catheter. They're, they're actually quite comfortable. So I start stimulating, and at that point I get the twitch response. About 30 seconds of treatment time, it starts to dissipate. And finally, let's say for musculocutaneous, in about a minute, they release. There's no local anesthetic at all. It's all thermal effect. So I know I have the area. I'm always talking to my patients. There's no sedation or wide awake. And how are you feeling? And if they have any dysesthesia, I can abort it immediately. Uh, this is my stimulator. So this is an external one. The other one's built in. I, I really like this one, so I tend to use it quite a bit. Uh, my theory is, is don't stimulate too high, because then you get way more nerves than you really want. So you want to be specifically on that spot. Uh, you saw that slide before. This is normal. This is abnormal anatomy, so you need to know that you're getting a good stimulus response. There's no local here, because if I do that, 
it distorts the anatomy, and I can't see the tip of the needle under ultrasound, and I use an in-plane technique all the time. I need to know exactly where that needle is. Uh, just a slide indicating how I do this. Here's the important thing. I see a lot of people with fibrosis, a lot of people, and especially if they've had phenol or alcohol. And let's say I'm asked to do something after to repeat the block and see if we can do anything more. That's really difficult for me. So I really rely on neurostimulation, very much so. Uh, we saw this patient's uh, result, and that's kind of the setup in my office. I do this in an outpatient facility. I also have fluoro there, but I don't use it for that. So how are we doing with time? We're doing good? Okay. Well, uh, here's the important thing. If you want to hear more about it, technically I will. One last thing. With um, radiofrequency and erotomy, we see a lot of patients with pacemakers, spinal cord stimulators, drug infusion systems, ACDs, and deep brain stimulators. We can't use radio frequency, it interferes with that. Cryo does not, except for the little stimulus response for uh, when you're finding the nerve. And it can be repeated. And this is where we're gonna go next with radio frequency, pulsed radio frequency. Lower temperature uh, preserves the epineurium, number one, and it can be easily repeated. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So and just for your question, so if you're a surgeon, we do, do nothing that will bother you because you will see no change because it's inside the epineurium. So it won't change surgical outcomes. So, one question. Have, we have the time for just one question. Nothing? Okay, yeah. Talk about adverse effects or potential issues. So, we're, we're, we're doing a retrospective review right now. He's not had a single adverse effect. It's ice. It doesn't hurt anything else, and he's seeing the entry point. So, no one has complained of dyslipidia or pain. I do these people under anticoagulation. Uh, I prefer to hold it, but if we can't, because of the danger of uh, repeat stroke. I still get good results. No bleeding, no infection, no distribution of this. I've probably done this in back anyway, so lumbar back, about 2,000 prior to the body. So I've got great experience. For spasticity, uh, I haven't seen any dissociation. Any um, and it is a pain killing technique. So it's designed to get rid of pain, so you won't get pain. Une question comment dans votre hiérarchie de décision vous faites la part entre votre technique et éventuellement la phénolisation et l'alcoolisation des branches des mêmes nerfs à quel moment vous choisissez l'une ou l'autre et derrière ça la question c'est la réversibilité Paul 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 first Translate the question oh, of uh, so uh, and the talk yes. in a microphone for the translator. Uh, so the question is, where in our planning triage do we decide that we're going to do uh, coronomotomy versus alcohol or phenol? So uh, we did not do a lot of phenol or alcohol before. I do it now. But Dan, being an anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist, they don't like phenol and alcohol because they've seen a lot of damage, and the surgeons didn't like it. So right now, it's just as easy for us. It lasts much longer. We're now at two years, and people are maintaining their function. And because it doesn't cause an aroma or neuritis, we're not seeing any side effects. So the only muscles I'm doing for, the only nerves I'm doing for phenol now is the obturator. There are a few patients that we have that are tetraplegic and incredibly spastic. Dan is by himself. He doesn't have a nurse. So the patients won't sit still because of clonus, so I might do phenol. But right now, we're trying to do everyone. We're trying to buy, there's a, a portable machine in the US for $4,000. We're trying to get that, because the availability in Europe, it's probably about 60,000 euros, the current. So a portable machine anyone could use in their office, you would do it exactly the way you do a nerve block. So for us, there's no reason to do phenol if we can do it this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.